third Sunday, and on the third Sundays, we on third Sundays we normally open up the altar. If you've come this morning and you maybe you have a heavy heart, or you're thinking of someone else and you want to be lifted up before the Lord, we don't need to know the prayer requests. We you, we're not going to ask you to say anything um, today, but you can just come forward and be counted in that number. We want to lift you before the Lord at this time. Would you would you come now? This time. Amen. There's time and room. It's all good. It's all good. Time and room. Keep spreading the center. Keep spreading the center. Yeah. Y'all separate one more. Let, let some, some room coming up. Someone else is coming up. So, yeah. 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 It was Jesus who said, my house should be a house of prayer. Make time and room for prayer. Amen. 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 Come on down. Amen. 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 I should have asked the whole church to come. <laughs> Father, we come. Um, man, by the response, you, you see your people. Um, man, I'm so glad we get to call you Father. And not all of us have had a good dad, but, but those of us who have, we, we know the joy it is to, to come to you as Father. Yes. We know what it's like to be pulled in close. So how have, have our heads rubbed. Told that, that we are loved. That you care for us. Pray right now, Lord God, as you see each one of your children who stand here today, Lord God, that, that they would feel your head rub. They'd feel you pull them in close today. They'd have a sense of, of knowing and realizing that you, you care about them. Pray, Lord God, that, that you would allow it to resonate in their, their, their hearts, Lord God, that you care about what's happening in their lives. Uh, we, we know and we recognize, Lord God, what's happening in this little old church here, Lord God. Um, is a small part of what's happening throughout the world. There are literally millions at this very hour and moment, Lord God, gathered in your name, yes. seeking your face, uh, lifting up prayers to you. And yet, Lord God, because of your omniscience, your omnipotence, Lord God, because of your omnipresence, Lord God, you yet hear us. Yes. It's not a prayer or a heart, Lord God, that is calling out to you that, that your ear is not sensitive to. Amen. For that, Lord God, we're, we're so grateful and thankful today. Yeah. You hear our cries. You hear our prayers. You hear 
and see us, Lord God. You hear our hearts, Lord God. So we thank you for that truth today. Lord God, your, your children, as they stand before you, Lord, they, they have a myriad of requests, Lord God. The variety is, is, is such that I, I don't know what their hearts are praying for. I, I don't know what, what, what's uh, the concerns they lift to you. I don't know the cares that they bring before you, Lord God. I don't know their request individually, but I'm so grateful you know. So, Lord God, in this very moment, I, I lift each one of them before you, Lord God. Each situation that they're, they're bringing before you, e each person that they're bringing before you, Lord God, e each door that they need opened or closed that, that uh, you bring before you, e each illness, each sickness, e each request for help, Lord God, we lift them before you today, Lord God. You know what they need. Lord God, I pray that you be a God of comfort. Your word tells us that you are the God of all comfort, Lord God. That you're able to grant peace, Lord God. A part of the reality of us knowing the, the, uh, your son is, is, is the testimony that he is the Prince of Peace, Lord. We've come to a, a God who, who is a God of, of rest, Lord God. A God who's able to, to take on our heavy burdens, our heavy loads, and, and, and that we could give them over to you, Lord God, and, and have a faith and, and, and assurance that you can carry them, you, you can take them, you can bear them, that we don't have to bear it ourselves. So, Lord God, I, I do pray that you give us the grace to leave it at the altar. Yes. To place it upon you. Yes. Whatever it is, Lord God. To not be plagued with worry or anxiety. Yes. Lord God, but you, you'd allow us to place our cares upon you, then rest. Oh, yes. Yes. Rest in faith and trust mm -hmm. and hope. That you're able. But not only are you able, Lord God, to bring to fruition what we think, Lord God, but your word tells us you're able to do above and beyond what we think. Above and beyond what we can imagine. And so, Lord God, I pray in this moment that you do just that. That you show up in that way in the lives of your children. Lord God, and if it's not in your will to answer in the way that we, we think you should answer, Lord God, give us the grace to walk it out knowing that you, your grace is sufficient. But if you're saying, hey, sit there in this, Lord God, give, give us the, the strength to just keep on walking. Help us to know that you're enough, Lord God. You're, to keep, you're able to keep us in the midst of it. We thank you, Lord God. Because if you don't do anything else, as being individuals that can call you Father, Lord God, we know that you've already done enough. That you've already worked it out for us. That you've already fixed the situation. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We ultimately thank you for our redemption. Yes. And the very fact, Lord God, that, that we have been brought into your family. Yes. Something that we do not deserve. Amen. Be with us now. Yes. Walk with your children. Yes. And be with them. Yes. And we'll be quick yes. to give you all the honor, yes. all the praise, yes. and all the glory. In the matches of powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles this morning, and if you're in Mark chapter 8, would you affirm that this morning by saying, I'm there? I'm there. Amen. This morning, we're going to continue our walk through the gospel of Mark, this witness testimony. 
of the life and ministry of Jesus. We just started this back up a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, initially, we had planned to kind of bring uh, Mark chapter 8 to a close, but, but uh, we're not going to be able to do that. We're just going to kind of focus on verses 27 through 33, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off uh, verses 34 through 38 until next week. I was going to try to get all of it in one fell swoop, but it was just too much to try to do it all at one time. And so uh, we're, we're going to navigate it uh, this morning. So I'm going to ask if you would follow along with me. Um, beginning at verse 27, I'm going to read through verse 33. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and it reads as such. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. I mentioned last week that one of the themes of uh, the eighth chapter of Mark is this nature of, of blindness versus clarity of sight or vision specifically around the person of Jesus. Uh, we've seen the Pharisees, they approach Jesus, they come to Jesus, and they're like, hey, um, despite them having been around during all of, of Jesus' ministry up to this point and seeing him do certain things, they come to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, uh, why, why don't you just show me, show me, a, show us a sign. And Jesus, in, in sort of a, a righteous uh, indignation and frustration, is like, listen, I ain't showing y'all nothing else. What more do I need to see? There, there's no more signs for this generation. You, you've seen enough of them. We see Jesus' disciples arguing about their need for bread when they get into the boat and, and they're traveling somewhere. And they're like, man, we forgot to pack enough bread. And Jesus like, is, is almost ready to pull his hair out at this point. They've just seen Jesus do this miraculous work of feeding 4,000. And after seeing him in chapter 6, feed 5,000 plus people. And, and, and both of these instances, they, they've seen Jesus do something that, that is extremely miraculous. And, and yet here they're arguing about, okay, we don't have enough bread for the trip. And Jesus is like, man, something is not connecting here. It's not firing up for you. Amen. Something spiritually is not, is not adding up for you. you and, and he goes on to say, listen, you, you, you have eyes, but you, you, you don't see. And you have ears, but you can't hear. Now as we come to the end of the chapter, we have this encounter between Jesus and his disciples that could be appropriately dubbed as a come to Jesus moment. Yes. It's a moment where Jesus says, okay guys, who do you believe I am? And who do you perceive me to be? And this becomes like this significant moment and we'll get into a little bit next time we're together with, uh, in this text becomes a significant moment that, that also has these significant 
implication. All right. Who, who do you say that I am? Admittedly, um, um, there's some sermons uh, that are encouraging and uplifting. Um, I'm not saying this ain't that, but she's a vernacular. But, but it's not all the way that. Over the next couple weeks, this is far more challenging than it is kind of this like uplifting all right, man. Uh, deal. And that's cool because that's preaching the whole counsel of God. All right. All right. The old preacher used to say, hey, some days you should leave shouting, some days you should leave beating your chest. <laughs> that's just the reality of it. Uh -huh. And I think as we kind of begin to navigate this text, this is a big question that, that might leave some of us or should leave some of us sort of challenged a bit. Who, who do you say that I am? All right, all right. Watch a short documentary kind of episode this week about a man in Kenya uh, who claims to be the second coming of Jesus. He lives today, claims to be this. The documentary is pretty interesting because we get to see the different perspectives of individuals as they consider this brother's claim. There are those who deny who he says he is. And as a result, when they're asked about him, they respond saying, hey, he's a liar and he's a fraud. No one should listen to him. In one scene, they take him to, to this uh, village that is about 30 minutes outside of his village, which is far more popular, more, more like the city where the market's contained. And, and you've got him walking through and, and just kind of getting the response of those around uh, him. And there are so many people that, that surround him. There's crowds that are coming up to him that are happy to see him, yet they're really indifferent towards him. When they get asked about him, they, they, they say, hey, you know what, we like him, but that doesn't necessarily mean we believe. You even get the perspective of the filmmaker, who really is this inquisitive skeptic. He admits, he's like, hey, listen, I, I, I don't necessarily believe him, yet, yet I'm curious to his uh, his claims and how others view him and I'm a bit enamored by his claims and, and others responses to him so that's why I'm here and then you got the perspective of this man's followers these are individuals who fully embraced his claim and as a result they spent much of their time charismatically worshipping him yes lord and praying to him, and living near to him in a very cultish way. What's so fascinating about this is that you get to see how people live based upon their perspective of who he is. Believing one thing about him causes them to respond in a certain way. Yes, Lord. Believing another way about him causes them to respond in another way. In our text today, we are confronted with the reality that just like in this modern day picture, we will live in a certain way based upon what we believe about Jesus. Let me put it this way. To believe in Jesus should have, should, opportunity, should have some level of implication on your life. That's right. That's right. Something 
should be different as a result of you claiming to believe Jesus. Let, let me say it another way. Let me give you the other picture. Even if you say you don't believe Jesus. Uh, that should mean something about your life. What am I getting at? Th there's no in-between. That's my Like, 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 it's hokey pokey, right? It's, 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 it's right foot in, right foot out. One or the other. But we're not going to play the game of it, of, of saying, hey, you know what, uh, sometimes I'm in and sometimes, no, 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 that's not how it works. I, 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 thanks, Brother Brown, he's finishing my sermon. <laughs> it's all right, that's good. E either you believe who he is or you don't believe who he is. That's right. That's right. And what you believe about him will have some level of implication on your life. Yes. As such, it becomes critical to consider the question, who is Jesus to you? We get presented just a couple points today. We'll finish up next week. You get presented with, with first a moment of a very important question. Set the scene, Jesus and his disciples are traveling to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is this, this town that was dedicated to Caesar on behalf of Herod's son Philip, hence its name. Philip is like, we're gonna put both of our names in. So it's called Caesarea Philippi. It's this place that's known for kind of this, this um, Vast and, and various worship of multiple gods. Yes, uh -huh. Temples that are built just so you can go and worship whatever you want to worship. All right. It's kind of interesting that, that as they're traveling to Caesarea Philippi, here's Jesus who's going to, to present this, this question. He's going to ask them, hey, hey guys, who, who, who do people say that I am? What are, what are folks saying about me? Verse 28, they respond to him. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. The disciples' responses are, are pretty interesting here. As one commentator points out, the responses they give, while they show that people sort of look at Jesus in a highly esteemed and respected way, they actually shortchange Jesus, and as a result, their assessments are actually pretty dangerous. Said another way. They have a high view of Jesus, but it's problematic because it's not high enough. I like, yeah, he's a, he's, he's a God that we respect, that we think highly of. He's a good dude. But, 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 that's problematic because he's not just a good dude. He's not just like cool. He, he's not just like uh, what, they, what they come to assess him as. No, no, no. They're shortchanging Jesus. He's far more than that. Some of them say, hey, he's John the Baptist. In other words, they're, they're, they're saying, hey, he, he's a great man. He's a man who has this passion for God. He's doing great work for God. He, he's passionate about the things of God. He's almost radical and wild in his affections for the Lord. He, he has a great message. He teaches. He, he does great things. Man, even Herod believed this. Remember in the scripture, Herod believed that, okay, oh snap, am I scared? Because this, 
this guy must be John the Baptist reincarnated. Some of them said he's Elijah. This is a high compliment. They're saying, man, I mean, he's akin to the greatest prophet that we know. Elijah did some pretty amazing and miraculous things. I, I put him on that level with Elijah. I, I, I put him in, in, in that discussion. He, he's this individual who, who must have access to great power. And, and so he, he, he's got to be uh, 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 on that level with, with, with that kind of level of strength and ability. And then he said, well, some just say, you know what? You're one of the prophets. Uh -huh. In other words, it's like, man, you, you're like a great teacher. Uh -huh. You're one who, who, who's worthy to be listened to uh -huh. and heard. Uh -huh. but, but I don't want to give you a certain level of authority. <laughs> No, I can't listen. I, I think that you speak maybe the word and revelation of God, but I ain't going as far as to say you are the word of God. Here's the thing. This is not far from how many people speak of Jesus today. You know, there's a whole lot of folks who like Jesus. A whole lot of folks that like Jesus. They, 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 love, they love to cherry pick yes, Lord. much of what he teaches. Yes, Lord. They love that Jesus speaks about love. They love that Jesus seems to advocate for the disenfranchised. Yes, Lord. They love that, that he says, don't, be, don't judge. All right, all they, they, they love that he says, hey, get, get, get the beam out of your own eye. They, they, they love that he stands up for the, the condemned, adulterous woman and says, hey, he who is without sin cast the first stone. They, they love to quote all of that. There are a lot of things they like about Jesus, but the problem is that becomes dangerous is how many people shortchange Jesus with their assessments. To take him as good and not take him as God is not enough. To take just a few things he teaches and say, yeah, that's a, that's a good ethic. Uh -huh. And not, yes. not understand it uh -huh. as the ethic. Uh -huh. It's problematic. Uh -huh. Hey, to see him as a way and not see him as the way. That's right. Lord, yeah. It's problematic. This is the problem John reveals in, in John 1, 10 and 11. He says he was in the world and the world was made by him, yet the world knew him not. Well, what is he getting at there? He's saying, listen, uh, Jesus comes into the world and he walks into that thing. And, and guess what? Everything that's around, he is the very agent of creation, yet he was not recognized as such. And it's problematic when we look at Jesus and we do not see him for the fullness for which he is and who he is. No. Jesus is not just another prophet. Jesus is not just another John the Baptist. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. No, he, he's not Elijah. Uh -huh. Every message that John preached, uh -huh. and every prophetic work that Elijah did, right. is pointing to this culmination point in which Jesus would come. Yes. 
is Jesus and who, is, who we must see for who he is. But I love this. Jesus, he turns it personal. Ah, man, you know what? It's like, what folks saying about me? Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, that's good. Okay, I got you. I got you. Wonderful. Good. But, now, who do you say? A couple of interesting things. I, I, I love the fact that he doesn't claim he asks. <laughs> Different than our brother in, in Kenya comes saying, hey, you know what, this is who I am. Uh -huh. um, at this point in Jesus' ministry, Jesus is like, okay, who, who, who do you say that I am? That's right. And this is part, this, this is, this is, with intention and purposeful. It, it is to cause his followers to take this in, to listen to this, and, and to really assess uh, in their own hearts and in their own souls and with their own spirits. Man, who do I say that you are? What is my assessment of you? I also love that Jesus, before claiming anything, he has shown it's at this point we've been walking through the book of Mark we're all the way here we've seen Jesus work they've seen Jesus work they've seen him cast out Demons. I, I've gone through this litany multiple times. Cast out a, a demon in, in, out of a man in the synagogue in chapter 1. They, they've seen him calm the seas by speaking to the wind and the waves. They, they've seen him cast out a demon out of a man who, who's been just hanging out in the cemetery. They, they've seen him touch a, a man's daughter. and they, They've seen somebody just touch the hem of his garment and be healed. They, they've seen so much. And all of a sudden, here they come and he's like, okay, now who? You haven't even just heard the testimony. You've seen the testimony. You've heard me teach. You've seen me work. Now what do you have to say about me? Two application points here. One is for the one who's not come to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There is a challenge here to say, okay, well, have you considered Jesus? Not just on a surface level, not, not just on a sense of saying, okay, ah, oh, man, but, but uh, you know what, I, I've heard about him. No, no, but have you deeply considered who is he? Lord, have mercy. Who, 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 who is this, this, this uh, prophet from Galilee? That, that, that so many folks have, have, have heard about and talked about, so many folks have dedicated their lives to. The testimony is that he's gone into a grave and hung out there, but he got up and that his tomb is still empty today. Have you considered who he is? But even for us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, I think this is still appropriate for us. Amen. Amen. Consider the disciples here who I just mentioned seeing Jesus do a whole lot of stuff. Yes. Now he asked the question, okay, who do you say that I am? That's right. Oh, oh I Some of us are facing things in our life. Some of us are facing decisions in our life. And we've seen Jesus work. Okay, I got one good testimony. Somebody testified. We've seen Jesus work. 
Some of y'all off to Cuba. We'll move on. <laughs> we've seen Jesus act in our lives. We, we, we've seen him figuratively touch our situations. We, we've seen him figuratively cast out stuff in our situations. We, we've seen him figuratively uh, uh, cease the uh, waves and storms in our lives. We, we've seen him figuratively, maybe literally, feed us when the cupboards were empty. We, we've seen him show up when, when listen, we, we were in our own predicaments and situations and difficulties and trials and tribulations. Who do you say he is? Who do you say he is facing what you're facing now? I'm walking into a new storm. Yes. Yeah. Did you just forget? Yes. How he brought you out the one before? I know, I know uh, I've been talking a lot over these past few weeks about remembering. And maybe that's just what, what we, we should be thinking about right now. But, but, but listen, did, did you forget when he touched you the last time? No, I can't. Who do you say that I am? Did, did you forget how he showed up in your life the last time? Who do you say that I am? I like it that it's personal. This ain't mama's testimony. This ain't your homie's testimony. This, this ain't you, you, nobody else's testimony. No, who do you say? Why? It's a moment that is made personal with the question of what do you have to say about Jesus? What do you have to tell the world about Jesus? What do you have to communicate to others about who Jesus is? Who do you say that I am? You get this moment of great confession. Peter, whom we got to love, is always just kind of the outspoken one. So right up, hey, you are the Christ. Amen. This is a great moment. Because we get to see that Peter, he's like, hey, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll claim it. I'll say it. And the question becomes for you and I, who's going to speak up for Jesus? Who, who's going to declare, yeah, this is who you are. You, you are the Christ. You are the promised deliverer. You are the Messiah. You are, you are the one we've been waiting for. You, you are our Savior. You are the, the promise fulfilled. You, you are exactly who all the prophets have, and the writings have been communicating and testifying for. You are the Christ who's going to speak up. say to the world who's going to communicate now yes. he is the Christ yes. Thank you. I got this moment of, of question it's an important question I love it because Jesus when we look at the original construction of it it, it is, is a question that Jesus emphasizes as being critical. Jesus is asking it in a, in a way that says, hey, no, no, like, you got to get this right. You, 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 you have to, you have to give me an answer on this. Like, it's even far more critical than what other people say. It's, it's, criti it's, it's critical uh, that, that you get this personal understanding right. Amen. Who am I? Uh -huh. Amen. Let this rest with us. It's critical that we get this right. Yes. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to uh -huh. you? 
who is Jesus to me? Following oh, this moment of important questions, we, we interestingly get this moment of insurrection. Look with me again, beginning at verse 31. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. All right. And said, get behind me, Satan. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of God. So Jesus begins to teach and prophesy. In this instance, what he's, what he's preaching and prophesying about is that he's giving them a future picture of his own faith. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Special moment, actually, because he kind of like says, okay, let me let you guys behind the curtain. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'm going to reveal to you, I'm going to unveil to you the plan. Uh -huh. Here's the plan. Uh, guys, I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. I'm going to be murdered and executed. But don't trip. After three days, I'm coming back. Now, there are a couple, a couple key terms here. The first in verse 32, it says there that Jesus says this plainly. All right. That word plainly there means he said this boldly, bluntly, freely, confidently, and without reservation. All right. he, he pulls no punches here. All right. There's no sauce on this. All right. no, no sugar to help the medicine go down. All right. Jesus is like, listen, I ain't going to hold you. Excuse the vernacular again. Comes right out and says, okay. Here it is. Here's what's about to go down. I know what you might be envisioning, but 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 it's not gonna go that way. All right. Amen. Now all of us have had that person in our life who was blunt and direct. All right. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we know what that's like. That individual who says things with boldness, without reservation. Some of us, I know, know in our instance, some of us kids can be like that. It's just in their mind, they just say it. It's like, you can't take them to nobody's house. You kind of get concerned. Because they get there, they're just going to be like, oh, uh, you know, they get a plate. Oh, uh, this ain't cooked all the way. <laughs> you like to be quiet. Put your napkin over it. <laughs> they might be telling the truth, but there's no softness to it. The truth is, is that the truth, bluntly, unseasoned, can be a little jarring. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it can knock you back. Yeah. That's right. I, I mean, have a conversation today, and your breath ain't quite right, and have somebody say, hey, your, your breath is bad. <laughs> Some of y'all be coming to me. <laughs> Talking about we got a church discipline this year. <laughs> the truth is jarring in that way. In many ways, the, the disciples up to this point, they're, they're used to Jesus putting a little sauce on it. He, he normally speaks to them in parables, like illustrations that are familiar to them that they can point to. It kind of softens the blow. And sometimes they don't get it and they got to go and ask. And he'll, he'll, he'll give more explanation to it. But a little sauce to it. But not in this instance. The text says, he says it plainly. This causes Peter, who just had this great confession, to get equally bold. 
text says he pulls Jesus to the side. And then we get another key term here. And he rebuked Jesus. Rebuke here means to admonish and correct. It means to speak sternly towards something. In many ways, it means to adjudicate and assess something or someone as wrong in order to re uh, restrain them and redirect them. R.C. Sproul points out that this term is the same term in the gospel that's often used by Jesus when he's speaking to and calling out the demon possessed. That's right, that's right. In Mark 1, when Jesus tells the demon possessed man who's been disruptive in the synagogue, he tells him there, be quiet. And come out. Jesus there uses the term rebuke. And so here's Peter who hears Jesus' plain prophecy and, and he doesn't ask questions or ask for clar clarification. Instead, Peter takes it further and says, excuse me a second, guys. Jesus, can we have a word? <laughs> hey, we need, we need to talk. Man, you trip. These guys, they've left everything to follow you. No, no. That's not your fate. Uh -huh. That's not how this is going to go down. Uh -huh. What are you talking about? You need to go back out there and correct this. Uh -huh. I'm trying to paint the picture for you. I know y'all feel uncomfortable because he's talking Jesus this way. And you should feel uncomfortable. Ah, Jesus, I are you kidding me? Right now? You're telling them this? He ends up essentially we kind of get this vibe. He's like, man, you don't come here to be on no suicide mission. I don't know if you're going through something right now, Jesus, but you need to get it together. <laughs> Take a moment, come back out. In verse 33, Jesus responds, turning and seeing his disciples. I can almost picture this. He's like, oh. He rebukes Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. We know from Matthew's account that a part of what Peter says to Jesus is, this will never happen to you. And Jesus hears the words of Peter and calls them out as, a words, as words of, of satanic influence. I can take it a step further and say that Jesus sees the presence of Satan attempting to thwart and derail his mission. Jesus was very clear. His mission was a cross and not a crown in the way they thought it was. His goal was victory over death, not over the Romans. And yet he sees uh, Peter being used by Satan to derail this mission. And he has to call that out. A few things that we can take away here. First thing is, is that even though we may confess Jesus as Christ, we must consistently check that our view of him lines up with what he says about himself. Or put it another way, we cannot make Jesus fit into our box. We must fit into his. We've talked about this many times. That there's significant contrast in messianic pictures present in this moment. Jesus was saying he was about to do something that was very different from what they perceived their Messiah to be and do. And this ain't no fault of God's. These differences last even until today. Historically, uh, the Jewish people would interpret prophecies looking for a savior of their people that would exert almost this military national dominance and restoration and strength. 
where we would see prophetic statements about a suffering servant and, and, and we would uh, relate that to, to the redemptive savior that we have in, the, in places like the Psalms and the prophets. They would interpret this to speak of themselves as a nation rather than to speak to a coming Messiah. Uh -huh. The problem with that is that Jesus comes and clearly lays claim to being a, prof a prophesied Messiah that will obtain victory through suffering. And now Peter shows his cards here, hearkening to his traditional roots and understanding. And when he hears Jesus, uh, what Jesus says, essentially he says, this is not the Savior we're looking for. You're tripping, Jesus. I know what I just said, but, but that's not what you're supposed to do and how this story is supposed to go. Amen. After making this great confession about Jesus based on what he's seen, uh -huh. Peter rejects what he's saying now because he doesn't fit what he wants him to be. Uh -huh. Amen. Real question that we need to consider before we criticize Peter. whether or not our faith is strong enough to stick with God when he no longer fits the profile that we've created. Family. Lord have What do we do with Jesus when he no longer fits in your box? Lord have mercy. The one you made for him. Uh -huh. right, what are you going to do with, with Jesus when your prayers aren't, aren't answered in the way you thought they should. What are you going to do with Jesus when he challenges you in a way that you, you don't like? Will your confession remain the same? Well, I, I know you want me to give up all that. I didn't know you were trying to send me there. I didn't know you were trying to do all that in my life. I, I thought I could keep that to myself, but you want in that room too. But man, I called on you and you didn't answer the prayer like I wanted you to answer it. You have faith to be strong enough and confess. Yeah, you are the Christ. This is why people can often walk away from God. This is why people can often end up denying Jesus. It's all good when he was doing everything that you wanted him to do. But when he no longer fits into your, your box and your expectations, it's... I don't know. By the way, I know I've mentioned this before, but God's not obligated to fit in our box. That's right. That's right. Secondly, we, we need to have an understanding and declarative resolve that understands that anything that manipulates and speaks against the mission of God That's is right. not from God. Lord, have mercy. You know, too often we want to put commas and buts where God has placed periods. That's right. Yeah. And there are things that sometimes we look at as innocent and misguided when we need to take them as serious threats. That's right. Yes. And I'm not speaking so much about people because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but we need to be cautious, aware, and discerning of demonic influence that's not innocent. Yes. Yeah, I'll say this. Um, we need to be cautious and understand that Satan does use folks. Oh, yes. We need to be willing to call that out, not necessarily direct, directly. I'm not saying run around just saying, get me behind me, Satan. <laughs> But we do need to be able to adjust so that we can stand firm when we see Satan working. 
We need to make sure we're not being naive that Satan will attempt to derail and destroy. There is real opposition in this world that exists to keep you from being God-honoring and God-glorifying in your life and with your life. And, and, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that we need to start calling people Satan, but there are some people we need to let go. Okay, that, this side didn't hear, so I'm going to say it over. There's some folks in our lives that we need to let go. And pray for them from a distance. But they will keep pulling. And it's like, oh yeah, I want, I want to stay close, I want to stay close. You better discern and understand that there are people that are in your life, that they are sent there and they are not sent from God. And they are working to derail your mission. It's not them, it's not flesh and blood, but it's what's behind them. It's a puppet master. So there's real opposition. Because of that, you and I, we will face temptation that will be there with, with attempts to help mess up our lives. You, you don't think God doesn't want to derail a ministry? I'm sorry, not God. Satan doesn't want to derail a ministry. You, 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 you don't think that... that, that uh, Satan doesn't want to like call, cause something to be destroyed and messed up. That's trying to honor the Lord. You, you don't think that that uh, Satan doesn't want to destroy a marriage that is trying to glorify God. You think you're just gonna get to chill in that thing? No, no. Especially if you're trying to be God glorifying. Yes. You don't think if you're trying to live your life dedicated to godliness as a single person, Satan's not going to come around with, with, with temptation? Ah, he's going to come after you. What's going to happen? You think, and yes, we, we will face discouragement. Moments where, where we will feel to say, hey, give up, don't, don't keep going. Like, like, man, he will show up to give you a spirit of despondency. He will show up. You know the devil talk to. He'll show up to tell you, man, listen, you, you know, what you trying to do this for? You know who you are. You know who you aren't. Yes. New creation. Ah. Now who's what? Yeah. Where you were acting yesterday, I don't know how new you actually are supposed to be. You'll face moments where Satan will play on your confusion. Cause you to question God's good intentions for you in your life. Oh, yeah. If we're not aware of this and pick up on this, we can easily find ourselves off mission and in a whole different space than where God intends us to be. That's right. I love the example of Jesus here that he he discerns very clearly the presence of the enemy of God. Yes, Lord. Seeking to thwart the mission. Yes, Lord. This is a side note, but I love how Jesus and Peter can have this confrontation and the relationship can be retained after. All right. It's easy to be critical of Peter, but, but, but Peter doesn't leave in anger. Uh-huh. But he stays around. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm not trying to overcook this, but, but 
It's good to have relationships where you can call out Satan in his presence and his attempts to wreak havoc without the relationship being destroyed. Yes. Again, I'm not saying that we should run around calling each other Satan. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's good to long for relationships that are mature enough to handle calling out when the devil is trying to stir up issues and create havoc. Yes, Lord. Like, it, it, it's a mature thing in marriage when, when, when two people can say, yeah, you know what, that, that man, the enemy of God is trying to tear something up. Uh -huh. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. And I ain't got to take it like, oh, Millis is calling me the devil. Here you go. Huh. <laughs> But I can accept truth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can I admit God's working on me on that? Yes, sir. That's it. That's it. To where I can I, I can be spiritually mature enough to, to, to take some of those things and say, you know what, I'm wrong right now. All right, all right. I'm off base. Yeah, he is using me, and it not destroy the relationship. Yeah, yeah, you know what? He's trying to influence, I, and I'm not saying you're possessed, but I'm just saying, like, like he, I, man, my, my mind is tainted right now. Uh -huh. Furthermore, we'll move on closely related to this is the takeaway that we really cannot, I don't know, sometimes some of this might rub some folks wrong, but we really cannot trust ourselves. Oh, yeah. Amen. 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 What we want and what we often believe is good for us and what we often think we need is not always of God. Yes. Jesus says to Peter, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. In other words, Jesus looks at, at and Peter, and this is a moment of rebuke, but it's also a tender moment. It's like, hey, Peter, your heart and mind is in the right place right yeah. now. All right, all right. You're not thinking about the right stuff, man. Mm -hmm. you, you, you just declared, I am the Christ, and, and, and you just declared that I'm the Messiah that you've been waiting for, and I know what perspective you have. It's so part of why I told y'all to just be quiet for a while, because y'all still got more to learn. Uh -huh. But it's like, oh, man, I'm not, man, Pete, uh -huh. you, you probably got caught up somewhere, but your mind ain't in the right place. Uh -huh. I need you to bring it back. Uh -huh. Many of us know in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, strong language. Who can know it? Some of us can be disappointed God doesn't meet our expectations, but the reality is sometimes our expectations of God can be built on tainted and corrupt intentions. That's right. Like, we got to check our hearts. That's right. Like I, I feel comfortable saying this. Like I, we can't trust us. Some of the worst advice in the world: follow your heart. Mm -mm. Some people follow their heart right to the unemployment line. I'm gonna give them a piece of my mind. I'm going to tell you. Mm. Sometimes we don't like what God prohibits, what God says is right, and what, what he says is wrong. But could you consider that that could be because we have a bit towards stubbornness? Yes. Towards authority? Yes. Could that be because we have hearts that are rebellious? Yes. Could that be because we have desires that are corrupt? Or that we want things that are not really good for us. That is actually why we are developing arguments against God. Some of us never want to own. It's not God. It's us. It's us. 
this moment, I think it's right to understand Peter is being sincerely deceived. It's interesting because life comes at you fast. Yeah. Yeah. One moment you're making this great confession about Jesus being the Christ, and the next moment you're being called out for being used by Satan. Mm -hmm. You can be the star pupil in one breath and then sent to the principal's office in the next. Uh -huh. but the truth is, this is life. Yeah. <laughs> It's easy to find ourselves slipping up in the flesh if yes. we're not careful. Yes, Lord, have mercy. One moment you're praising the Lord, the next moment you're struggling not to cut somebody out. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for saying amen. <laughs> One moment you're here getting along with everybody only to go home and not be able to get along with your somebody. Amen. One moment you're having victory over your spiritual struggles and the next year you're pulled back into those struggles. The heart can be deceived and we can be influenced if we're not careful. We gotta, we, we gotta be, be very watchful about this thing. Yeah. yeah. Bringing into this, this, this point, I find it so interesting and appropriate. This is the same Peter who writes in 1 Peter 5, hey, be sober. Uh -huh. Be watchful. Uh -huh. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, singing whom someone to devour. Uh -huh. This same Peter got the lesson. He's like, hey, listen, it remains necessary that we remain guarded and submit ourselves to the Lord in order that our hearts be kept from and, and, and kept in temptation and kept from being used to derail God's mission in our life. You gotta be watchful, family. Because yeah. it's easy to slip off. Yeah. Let me say this and we'll go. I'm so thankful. I'm glad that my salvation, my declared righteous standing before the Lord, that allows me to have a relationship with Him. Yes, Lord. Is not predicated or based on my righteousness Lord, or what I've done right or how I keep myself from doing wrong. Right. But it's solely based on the righteousness of Jesus and what he has accomplished for me. Here's the point. All of us are like Peter. We do well one minute and we jack up the next. We get it right in one moment but we mess up in the next. And if our relationship with God was based on our ability to keep ourselves and to bat a thousand and to get it right all the, all the time, none of us would be recognized or known as children of God. The good news today is that Jesus came precisely so Peter could navigate the ups and downs of right and wrong. And not only Peter, but you and I as well. Amen. Don't hear me wrong today. By no means am I preaching that any of us should feel comfortable in sin. Right. Or that it's okay to sin. Right. However, what I am saying is that Jesus came because we are incapable of keeping ourselves totally from sin. Right. We are incapable of being perfect. We are incapable of keeping our feet out of our mouths. We are incapable of not falling through temptation all the time. We are incapable of treating everybody right all the time. We are incapable of keeping our thoughts to ourselves all the time. We are incapable of overcoming lust and greed and pride and selfishness and bitterness and vengefulness and whatever else you want to fill in the blank with. We are incapable of keeping ourselves from that all the time. And the good news is, is that Jesus came to be perfect to save the imperfect. First John. 
2 verse 1. I quote it often because I love it so much. It's the idea. John writes, little children, I'm writing to you so that you would not sin. Uh-huh. Don't sin. I'm not telling you sin is okay. Uh-huh. I want you to be clear with that. Uh-huh. But if you do sin, you have an advocate yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lord with the Father, yes, uh-huh. Jesus Christ, yes. the righteous. Yes. Lord have mercy. In other words, he, he is the epitome of righteousness. Yes. Yes. He is righteous to fill up our unrighteousness. Yes. He is righteous to cover our unrighteousness. Yes. He is righteous to be righteous where, where we can't be yes. righteous. Yes. He has come to be what we cannot be. Amen. So the invitation, the invitation to Jesus is not an invitation to perfection, but to reception. It is an invitation to receive the gift that he has given to us. It's an invitation to receive the gift of his sacrifice, the gift of his righteousness. The gift of his payment for our sins. The gift of his victory over sin, death, the grave, and judgment. The, the victory over a cleansing and the, 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 the invitation and the gift to be cleansed where, where we could not be cleansed. To be forgiven where we needed to be forgiven. A gift to receive something we could not earn on our own. It's not an invitation to perfection. It is an invitation to receive the wonderful gift of salvation that only he can give. Why? Because he is the Christ. Yes, Lord. That's who I say he is. Yes. That's who we must say he is. Yes. And the invitation is open to all who will repent and place their faith in what he has done on the cross and out of the grave. That's right. You will be cleansed, forgiven, and made a new creation. Yes. No matter what the enemy says. Lord ever. You're secure uh-huh. in him and in him alone. We have a next steps room. If you're here, and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior. Again, I say this invitation. It's to you today. All right. Who will you say that he is? I can tell you that he came to give you life and life more abundant. Not in some, some weird uh, prosperity, tangible way, but, but in a real spiritual sense. He came to give you joy that you've never known, peace that you've never known, to show you love that you've never seen. Came to be your righteousness where you can't be righteous. All you must do is repent, place your faith in him. What he's done on, out, on the cross and out of the grave. Confess him today. As the word says, all who confess this, believe, will be saved. That's right. Would you stop by and let us know if you got more questions? But you don't need us. You can place that faith right now. Today. Let's pray and let's go home. Father God, we thank you. For who you are. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a loving God. We thank you for the testimony of your Son, Jesus, who is the Christ. The Word became flesh. The one who has dwelt among us. The one whose glory we have beheld. We've beheld. We've known, Lord God. Thank you for this amazing grace that we've been able to experience. Through his work on the cross and off the grave. So God, if there's one here today who's not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, would you move on their hearts, Lord God, to draw them to you today? Despite me, despite anyone around, Lord God, would you make this moment personal for them? That's right. Would you allow them to hear the echoes of this chamber and into the, directly into their hearts, Lord God? The question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? 
Help them to respond in affirmation. You are the Christ. The one in which I need. Lord God, as we dismiss and depart this place, would you keep us in the hollows of your grace and mercy? Love on us. Watch over us. And keep us. We love you today. We thank you. It's in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.